everyone! Welcome to my channel. If you're new here, my name is Tessia and these are beauty lessons, what God is speaking, teaching, and revealing to me. Last week, we spent the week at the um, Scottsdale Waste Management Open. It is a golf tournament that brings in over 600,000. One source said 700,000 people. Um, this year, they actually were turning people away and shut down the event because it rained so much. And uh, so many people were showing up on Saturday and a lot of the uh, golf course was muddy. And so the places that where foot traffic would be were getting congested and people were just stuck in there. And so they stopped selling alcohol for a period of time and food. And they uh, told people that the open was closed because the open was closed um, because there were so many people. So um, what I wanted to share is one of my biggest takeaways from that event. Um, we go and share the gospel at a lot of public events, a lot of large events, and this is a normal thing for us. And I've gotten good at it over the years, fallen into a routine um, or a pattern. But this event was different. This event was different than any event we've ever done because it was the main place where you preach is an intersection. There's only one intersection that has entrance in through which people enter and one intersection where they're all funneled out. So everybody has to pass through this intersection. But this was a very um, drunk crowd, a very party crowd, and a crowd of people that did not want to hear the gospel. So we thought we'd give out way more tracks. Um, people were not taking tracks. They were either on their way in or on their way out. They just didn't really want to hear it. So the biggest takeaway I had was one day um, I was behind the camera uh, for a large portion of the day and I hadn't really said anything because this wasn't the type of event where people are engaging and wanting to talk. They're like going in or going out. They they kind of are trying to ignore you. So I wasn't having much, well, any really interaction or engagement and um, I was kind of in the spiritual realm like a sitting duck. And I began to feel, especially as things got darker and there was um, more drunkenness, I began to feel like headachey and kind of under, just under it, under um, opposition, under a spirit of resistance, just like darkness, heaviness. Um, I felt oppressed. I was feeling oppressed. And so I shared this with my husband and he said, do you want to get on the mic? I'm like, maybe you need to get on the mic. And I said, and say what? And he said, whatever you need to say to all these drunk people. Cause you know, I came out of that exact lifestyle, partying, drunkenness. Um, that, that is exactly what I came out of, um, years ago. And so, I mean, that's where I was. I was a college kid, you know, looking for the, the party. And that's what a lot of people are at these events. It's a lot of college students. Um, it's also just a lot of young people. It's actually people of every age, but a lot of um, young people and college age students are going to this event because it's a big party. So I was feeling really oppressed and um, just not good. And so I felt like as soon as David said that, I felt like God was stirring something in me and it was like, okay, I guess I got to get on the mic, which preaching is not my thing. Um, I like to share the gospel. I like to engage people one-on-one, -on -one, but I'm not big on preaching. I have shared before, um, but I'm not like hungry for it. Um, I'm not like, yes, give me the opportunity to get on the mic. It's more like you get on the mic and I'll talk to the people who come up listening to, to what's being preached. So I got on the mic and, um, you know, I preached the gospel and I told people um, that they're in pain and wounding and they can't really handle sobriety because if they were satisfied in sobriety, they wouldn't be drinking. But because they're so dissatisfied with their lives uh, sober, they have to get drunk. They have to turn to drugs, to substances. So, um, you know, I felt power in preaching the gospel and in occupying the space. So the next day, and what I felt like God was saying is um, you need to get out there and proclaim truth. Instead of just sitting by and standing by, you need to participate in proclaiming truth. So the next day, even though I was behind the camera, I began trying to hand out tracts as quickly as possible. I began trying to engage people as quickly as possible as soon as I got out there because I wanted to um, kind of put the truth forth and and be stand, kind of maintaining a position or taking up a position in the spiritual realm and um, in the natural realm, in the physical. 
because interjecting into people's days is, even if they reject it, even if they don't accept what you're doing, you're still standing and taking a position for truth. So an offensive position instead of a defensive position. And to, I mean, I was afraid the first day to, to preach and to share, you know, fear was present and approaching me. Um, and it was like, oh, I don't really want to do this, but I know God's telling me to do it. And so uh, I just did what God told me to, and there was a lot of peace and, and blessing in it. And so if you're one of those people who struggles to share the gospel, uh, my encouragement to you would be to jump in as quickly as possible. If you struggle with fear, just push past the fear as quickly as possible because the fear will only get worse and the opposition or hindrance will only get harder and more the more you don't do it. But the quicker you jump in, it's kind of like, I tell people it's like jumping in a swimming pool. You know, you can be that person who like creeps in down the steps and it takes forever and it's cold every single step you take, or you can just jump in and get used to the water quickly and um, start swimming around because the sooner you jump in, the sooner you can start swimming. Um, so I would uh, encourage you to, anytime you feel a prompting or a nudging from the Holy Spirit to share the gospel, I know what it's like to struggle with hesitation and um, I know what it's like to be victorious. And so the quicker you do it, the better you'll feel. That's basically my biggest takeaway from this outreach. The quicker you share the truth, the better you'll feel, even if they don't receive it. Regardless of how the, the other person responds, the quicker you share the truth, the better you'll feel. Um, and that I believe can apply to an outreach as well as to any time you're prompted to share the gospel in the grocery store wherever you are in your day-to-day -day life. The quicker you do it, the better you'll feel. Um, the next thing that I wanted to share is that we went to a pastor's dinner this week here in Tucson. There was an event and a lot of pastors came together and had dinner. And I looked up a church after the dinner and I found out that there is these, this church was a member of the Accepting and Affirming Baptist Association. And immediately that sounds like LGBTQ. So I look it up and of course it is, it's LGBTQ. It's accepting and affirming um, people of all genders, of all, which, you know, truthfully there's only two, um, people of all sexuality and uh, welcoming them into the body of Christ. But as we know, um, sin is sin and God does not accept our sin. Um, he accepts us and changes us. So. I believe that that is the problem with um, America and American Christianity, because David said the greatest thing that he learned on this uh, outreach or one of his biggest takeaways was that you have to call out sin. Because as soon as he would call out sin, people would respond. A lot of people drunk high would say, yeah, I love Jesus. I'm all for Jesus. And you call out their drunkenness and all of a sudden they're cursing you and angry at you. So realizing that the American church, which is not the true church of Christ, um, has accepted and affirmed sin. We say, yes, come as you are and stay as you are. That's the problem. We say, come as you are and stay as you are. Jesus said, come as you are and let me change you. Let me make you new. Let me make you into the creation that I want you to be. Behold, Corinthians uh, 5.17, behold, the old has passed away, the new has come. If anyone be in Christ, he's a new creation. He is not an old creation. You got to let God make you the new creation. So the biggest problem in American Christianity and um, watered down Christianity is that they aren't preaching the true gospel and we are accepting and affirming sin. Instead of calling out sin and saying, be holy, be sanctified, be set apart, be different from the world. We're saying, come as you are and stay as you are. And um, God still loves you. The truth is, yes, God does love you. God loves everyone. But whether or not you get to experience reconciled relationship with God depends on your response to the cross of Jesus Christ. Will you die to your sin? Jesus died for your sin. Will you die to your sin in order to receive newness of life, in order to receive resurrection life and resurrection power? You can't receive the resurrection power and the resurrection life into your life if you won't let the old die. You must let the old die in order to be resurrected, 
in order to be made new, the old must pass away. So I just thought that it was a clear depiction or a clear articulation of what is wrong with American Christianity. We have accepted and affirmed sin. Um, the next thing I wanted to share is that I was listening to a Derek Prince teaching this week. It just popped up on my YouTube. Actually, a, a little clip of it did. And then I felt like God said, listen to the full sermon. And the full sermon was longing for the return of Christ, longing for Christ and talking about that. And in part of it, Derek Prince was saying that many Christian churches are not a threat to the devil's kingdom because they are not evangelistic churches. They are not sending people out and um, changing, you know, touching Satan's kingdom of darkness and seeking to rescue people out of it and bring them into the kingdom of light. Many Christians are caught up in a church or many Christian churches are caught up in church activities. And so because they aren't a threat to the devil, because they're so busy with church and church activities, they aren't a threat to Satan's kingdom. And Satan says, go ahead. Keep doing all your church activities. Have all your, your worship services and your um, church functions and your um, gatherings and, and all your programs as long as you don't evangelize. As long as you don't go out and tell people about Jesus, that's fine. You go ahead. Hide in the church. And that's kind of another thing that God has shown me and us recently about American Christianity is the church is like a hiding place instead of a place. Uh, the church has taken a defensive position in the spirit instead of an offensive position. It's a position of let me hide here and let me hide my kids here and um, never really go out into the world and, and affect the world, affect the kingdom of darkness. Let's just make this our refuge and our hideout and our bunker. And if other people happen to find it and wander in, well, great, but we're not going to go out and tell people about Jesus. That seems to be the attitude and the mindset of many, many, many American Christians. And I know that was my mindset um, when I first came to Christ. I was so afraid of strangers. I was so afraid of talking to strangers. Um, if you asked me about my testimony, I would share, but I wouldn't go and, and share... Um, with a stranger about Jesus. It would just be if my my story came up, if my testimony came up. And so there has to be an attitude of action in order to be a threat to Satan's kingdom. And evangelism is on the forefront of that. You have to be in evangelism and have an evangelistic mindset in order to be a threat to the devil. Otherwise, um, you're just ministering to to other Christians, which there is a place to minister to other Christians and strengthen the body, but you also need to be able to reach the lost, to fulfill the Great Commission, to go and tell all the world uh, about what Jesus has done, teaching them to obey everything he commanded. That's what, and baptizing in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. That's what Jesus said. He said, go out into all the world and teach them to obey everything I've commanded you. So, um, you got to, in order to be a threat to Satan's kingdom, to the kingdom of darkness, you must be active in evangelism and, um, sharing the truth with those who don't know the truth, sharing the truth with the lost and the broken and the hurting. Um, another thing that I felt like touched me from that teaching was Derek Prince said the Christian life is a constant fight. He was referring to second Timothy, um, I believe it's four, seven, that says, I have fought the good fight. I have run the race. I have, um, I've kept the faith. So he was saying that the Christian life is a fight. And what he said that really stuck with me was you don't have to be a theologian in order to inherit eternal life or the kingdom of God, but you must have courage. There is, it's a fight. It's a constant fight. The Christian life is a war. It is a battle. It is, um, and I've wrestled with this idea. I don't always want to fight. Sometimes I say, God, I'm so tired of fighting. I'm so done fighting. But often we can reach those places when we are fighting in our own strength instead of fighting in him. Because truthfully, the Lord is a warrior and the battle belongs to him. So when you fight in his strength, when you fight in his power, you always overcome and there is never, um, defeat. So, and often we can give up after a um, short amount of time. David and I are reading this book called Kingdoms in Conflict. I forgot who it's by. It's by someone who had prison ministry. And um, 
he was in the White House at one point, forgot his name. Um, but he was talking about um, William Wilberforce and how he opposed slavery and the slave trade in the English um, or British government for years and years and years and years and years. And he saw no victory for years and years and years, but he persevered and kept going because God had called him to it. And eventually slavery was abolished. Um, but it wasn't abolished the first, second, third, fourth, fifth, sixth, seventh, you know, year that he keeps proposing it to the house and, um, trying to get this passed, the abolition of slavery. Um, and it almost passed uh, at one point, but it, it missed by like six votes. Um, and then it was more years after that, that it didn't pass. And so through that, the Christian life is a life of perseverance and um, believing the outcome of victory. So oftentimes I've heard it said in the Christian world that um, we already know the end. The end is of the story. You know, we're victorious in Christ. We know the end of the story. But I don't think many Christians live with that reality that they're victorious, that they'll win in Christ. I think many Christians get pushed back a little bit and they accept defeat. They accept living a subpar Christian life because they don't persevere in prayer, they don't persevere in faith, and they don't persevere with their will in action of op opposing Satan in their life. Um, another thing Derek Prince said was, your Christian life won't be go, go beyond your prayer life. Your Christian life will stop where your prayer life stops. And so I know in my personal life, I have experienced praying to God and saying, God, please solve this. And then, you know, walking away and going about my business. God, please solve this. And then going about my business. But there is much that can be accomplished in focused, undistracted, dedicated prayer. There is so much that can be accomplished there. And the other day I was praying about something that I have been praying about for a long time. And I said, God, this just must stop. This cannot be, this cannot continue. Um, and in my prayer time, I've prayed about this so many times before, and I felt like God, um, the devil was actually telling me that nothing was being accomplished in my prayer time. And I said out loud, you know, there will be fruit from this prayer time. I will accomplish something in the spirit. Um, there will be victory in this area. And I said, God, I need you to show me what your will is. I need this area to change. I need real breakthrough. And I was petitioning God and seeking him with all of my heart and praying out loud, you know, seeking him with my body and my whole, everything engaged in the prayer time. And I felt like God gave me an answer. He said, I want you to do this. And sometimes or oftentimes we don't pray through to, to reach that answer from God, that response from God. We stop short of um, the, the receiving of the answer. And we just pray to God and say, okay, here you go. You solve it. I'm going to go about my life now. When really God wants us to hear from heaven and obey him in order to carry out God's will and to do what he has called us to do, we need to know what he has called us to do. We need to receive from him divine plan, divine instruction, divine understanding. And a great example of this actually is Daniel um, chapter two. I was you know, again, that Derek Prince teaching, God really wanted to show me something through it. Um, he was talking about Daniel and uh, how he prayed to God to have Nebuchadnezzar's dream revealed. So Daniel, um, you know, he was in Babylon and uh, Nebuchadnezzar said, you know, tell me my dream or I'll kill you all. Tell me my dream and the interpretation or I'm going to kill you all. And they said, we can't do this. You're asking too much of us. And he says, okay, I'm going to kill all the, the wise men in Babylon. And Daniel wasn't there. He wasn't a part of it. But um, he was summoned to be killed because he was one of the uh, wise men in Babylon. And he said to the king's um, right-hand man, the commander of the king's guard, um, and he said, why is this happening? And he, and he explained the situation to him. And Daniel said, give me more time. Like, I'm going to get an answer. And um, the king gave him more time. So they prayed. And, and God revealed the dream to Daniel and the interpretation of it. And this was Daniel's response. It's Daniel chapter 2, verse 20. Praise. So this is what um, Daniel said. It says, then Daniel praised God, the God of heaven and said, 
Praise be to the name of God forever and ever. Wisdom and power are his. He changes times and seasons. He deposes kings and raises up others. He gives wisdom to the wise and knowledge to the discerning. He reveals deep and hidden things. He knows what lies in darkness and light dwells with him. I thank and praise you, God of my ancestors. You have given me wisdom and power. You have made known to me what we asked of you. You have made known to us the dream of the king. So I think it's very important, verse 23, when Daniel says, you have made known to me what we asked of you. There are many, many times where Christians fall short, stop short, and don't expect God to make known to them what they ask of him. God wants to lead us. He wants to guide us. He wants to direct us. But sometimes in this distracted world, we need to slow down, give God the time of day and seek him wholeheartedly. Jeremiah 29, 13, you will seek me and find me when you seek me with all of your heart. I will be found by you, declares the Lord. You have to stop and seek God with all of your heart. Sometimes there are things in life where God says, pray about it and leave it up to me. I want you to continue on in faith and trust. And then there's other times where God says, stop, seek me. I want to give you the answer. You're rushing past my will. You're you're not really listening to me. You're going your own way, assuming that I'm going to take care of it for you. So God wants to use us and he has things that he wants us to do, a role he wants us to play in achieving our victory, in receiving freedom, in, um, you know, fighting the good fight of faith. Paul didn't say that because God had just fought everything on his behalf. Paul had to fight the good fight and run the race. The same is true of us. We have to fight the good fight and run the race. We can't just expect that God is going to fight for us. Yes, he will fight on our behalf, but he won't do for us what he um, wants us to do. God tells us to do things for us to obey him. God doesn't live our life for us. He lives through us and in us, but he doesn't um, live our life for us. We don't just become, uh, you know, nothing robots and and God just takes over and um, we have no participation in the matter. That's why it's relationship. You submit to God and let him use you and work through you, but you participate in that um, submission and surrender and obedience. You participate. You have a role to play. You have a life that God has given you to live. And in order to live it to the fullness in Christ, you have um, a responsibility in your prayer life uh, to, to petition God, to seek him, and to receive from him, to expect to receive from God. Um, I think many Christians stop short in receiving from God and they just they just pray to God and say, there you go. Now I've given it all to you. I'm going to walk away. And, and that is not how relationship works at all. Um, I don't know of any other relationship on the face of this earth where someone just, you know, shares everything, dumps on someone and then walks away. And if that is happening, typically that's a very unhealthy relationship. So God wants to you to receive from him and expect to receive from him. And expect to receive um, truth and revelation and understanding and things um, that he tells you to do in in order for you to obey him. The last couple things that I want to share is um, God showed me the other day that worship equals trust. God's been convicting me that I haven't been worshiping him as much as I used to. I used to love worship. Um, I mean, I still do love worship, but it seems like it's one of those things that's kind of just been squeezed out of my life and it hasn't taken precedence or priority like it used to. I used to dance before the Lord, sing to the Lord, worship the Lord um, more regularly. And that isn't really a part of my life as much as it used to be. And so I had this thought that worship equals trust. Because when you're worshiping God, you're saying, God, you're greater than everything in all the world, including all my problems, all my difficulties, everything I'm facing, and um, you're going to fight on my behalf. And I trust you. I praise you. Um, I, I love you. And it's an act of, it's an act of trust. It's worship equals trust. So if you don't worship the Lord in your free time, or um, even in just your, your quiet time, if there's no space in your life where you're really wholeheartedly worshiping and praising God, I would encourage you to put that into your, your time because um, 
there's a place where worshiping God is trusting God and, and him filling you with his spirit. And it's a, another way to commune with him and to experience relationship with him. And, um, it's powerful. So I would encourage you to do that. The other, the very last thing that I'll share is God showed me recently that unforgiveness opens the door to fear. When you have unforgiveness in your heart in relationship, it is a sign or um, a symptom of self-protection. Because if you're living in unforgiveness, you're saying, you hurt me. I don't want you to hurt me again. I'm um, I'm going to make sure that it doesn't happen again. And it's self-protection and self-preservation, which Jesus said, he who seeks to save his life or preserve his life will lose it. But whoever loses his life for my sake will gain it. And so God was just showing me that when you operate in forgiveness, which is what Jesus did, he operated in forgiveness, even towards those who hadn't repented um, or were sorry at all. When you operate in forgiveness, you actually are standing in love and are more secure than operating in unforgiveness. Unforgiveness opens the door to fear and forgiveness opens the door to security and love because God isn't threatened by people. He's not threatened by their sin. He's not threatened by what they can do to him. And so when we operate in forgiveness, we're saying, God, I trust you and um, I'm, I won't let this threaten me. I'm going to stand secure in your love. I'm going to hide myself in you because forgiveness is a way that we abide in Christ. It's, you know, Jesus said, um, if you don't forgive uh, other people's sins, your heavenly father won't forgive you of yours. So you can't really abide in Christ and be in his spirit covered by him if you're living in unforgiveness and operating in unforgiveness. So um, in order to abide under the shadow of the almighty, you have to forgive. And when you forgive, it um, brings security and strength and um, freedom. It brings freedom to your life. So those are the things that God was showing me this week. Um, I pray that this video blesses you. I pray it encourages you. And I'm going to pray. Also, um, I do sell evangelistic earrings. Behind every piece of beauty, there is a cross or a reason behind the beauty. And anytime someone comments on your earrings, you're supposed to share with that person about the reason behind the beauty in your life, which is Jesus. Share with them your testimony, share with them a verse, um, share with them anything. You'd be surprised how many people have never heard John 3, 16. Um, how many people have never heard that Jesus died on the cross paying for their sin? You can say Jesus died on the cross. People have heard that, but they've never heard about the why, that he died paying for their sin because sin costs something and we're all gonna be judged when we die. And in order to escape that judgment, you need to receive the free payment the sacrifice of Jesus Christ and what he did on the cross for your sin. Otherwise, you'll be held accountable for your sin. And so um, if you'd like those, I've linked them in the description below. If this um, video blessed you in any way, please like or comment or share it um, or subscribe because that also helps my content get seen by more people. And comment below if you have any prayer requests. I would love to come alongside you and pray for you. God, I just thank you for everyone who is watching this video, Lord, and watches this video. God, I pray that you would minister to them, that they would have a renewed expectation to receive from you, God. I pray that they would gain victory and confidence in your spirit, that they can overcome in whatever they're struggling with, in whatever um, trials they have. Romans 8, 31 says, um, if God is for us, who can be against us? So Lord, I pray that they would have confidence in you you, confidence in your spirit, and you would renew whatever um, strength needs to be renewed in areas of long-term strongholds. I pray that people would have a renewed vigor and a renewed confidence and a renewed strength to overcome and a renewed will to overcome in the areas that seem so unconquerable or indefeatable in their, undefeatable in their lives, and um, you would strengthen them and enable them to do it. I ask it all in your name, in Jesus' name. So I pray you all have a blessed and a beautiful day, a day filled with God's beauty. Until next time, bye.